What they've done is they've created a solution to a very common problem. Hey everybody and welcome back to H Invests. Today we're going to be talking about Facebook. Is it a quality business? What are their growth prospects looking like going forward? And is this a good time to buy the shares? Let's go through it together and find out. So Facebook's key businesses comprise of Facebook itself, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Oculus. How do they make their money? Through global advertising, right? In fact, 98% of Facebook's revenue comes from global advertising. Advertising on their platforms, businesses pay for those ads, and Facebook's customers see those ads. One really great thing about this business model is it means Facebook has really low marginal costs. What that means is that it doesn't cost Facebook much extra money in order for them to list a new ad. So they will get a lot of new ad revenue, but the cost of that sale is really, really low. So how would Facebook grow their revenue? Well, they would grow their revenue by having more people on their platform, which means that their platform is more valuable because ads can reach more people and more targeted people. Okay, so looking at this chart from Facebook's Q4 results, you can see its daily active users are on the rise, which is a very positive sign. They currently stand at 1.8 billion, which is massive. Whilst this is great, we want to make sure this isn't the only way that Facebook is growing because with 1.8 billion, that's probably about 30% of the world's population. And there's only so much that Facebook can grow its numbers before it becomes saturated and there are no new people to even be able to come onto Facebook. So what is really positive to see is that Facebook average revenue per user is also on the rise. The first thing to note about this chart is compare Q4 to Q4, Q4 last year uh, because that's the holiday season and there's increased advertising spending in those quarters. A few reasons why this trend is positive and I expect it to continue to go up in the future. Number one, businesses are moving online and when you're not customer location dependent on certain customers, you can then reach a global audience as opposed to having to advertise to a local area. Businesses are really realizing the benefit of Facebook's um, data analytics where it analyzes um, your data and it tailors the ads to you. So the ads are having a much higher success rate and then uh, businesses are willing to pay more for those ads. If you're enjoying this video so far, please consider giving it a like. It's really helping the channel grow. We're also seeing Instagram doing very well. It's becoming much more important for businesses, brands, and for sole traders as well. For example, myself, I set up my first Instagram recently to help promote H Invests. Instagram also had this new feature called Instagram Shopping, another thing to support brands, where if you're wearing a certain shirt or merchandise, or if there's something in the picture, what you can do is you can set it up so if you click on it, then it can take the customer straight to that page and they can buy it right then and there, which I think is a really useful tool. Another thing that Facebook have done is they've set up Instagram Reels, which will serve as a good rival for TikTok going forward. And Oculus, I mean, it's great to get exposure to the both the virtual reality and the gaming market. Oculus is still a relatively small part of its business and I don't think it should be uh, a core part of the decision when thinking about the Facebook investment thesis, but it's a great bonus nonetheless, and the technology is certainly pretty cool. So what about WhatsApp? Where is the monetization on WhatsApp? So a couple of years ago, what Facebook did is they tried to do a subscription-based service on WhatsApp, so charging people uh, a pound a year for a subscription, but that didn't work very well. So what else are they doing? They've tried WhatsApp Pay in India, where you can effectively use uh, the WhatsApp on your phone to pay for things in a shop. But that is a very, very competitive market, and I'm not sure if it's the way to go with WhatsApp going forward. So what they've done is they've created a solution to a very common problem, and hopefully we will see this kickstart in WhatsApp in the next couple of years. Have you ever had to wait hundreds of minutes listening uh, on to dodgy music on your phone as you wait for your utility company or your bank to answer. It can often be a pain, the line can often break, communication is often slow. So effectively what a lot of these businesses are doing is they're setting up online chats so you can chat as opposed to go on the phone. What WhatsApp plan to do is they plan to centralize all of this. So the way it will work 
is businesses will pay a small fee and then they will go onto WhatsApp and you can chat directly as a customer with your business, uh, that, with the business that you use on WhatsApp. So you could have your t utility companies, banks, all there and ready for you and those businesses will pay a small fee to do that. Why would they pay that small fee? To improve their customer service. Facebook has a very wide economic moat. It benefits from a network effect where the more people that are on Facebook, the more people that benefits. If people are new to social media, they will likely sign up to one of Facebook's platforms where all of their friends already are and they can talk to everybody instantly. Another thing that Facebook has, if they have barriers to exit, what I mean by this is people build up really strong profiles on Facebook, but particularly on Instagram. And what this will mean is that it's very difficult for people to, to leave it when they've put so much time investment into it. Yes, they might go to another social media platform, but it's very likely that they won't leave the one that they're currently on and they will keep building their profile because they've already invested so much time into it. A third economic mode to consider is effectively a load of data information under intangible assets. I mentioned this briefly a minute ago, Facebook collects data on customers. It then uses this data to help improve the targeting of their ads. Then the ads will have a higher success rate and thus businesses will be willing to pay Facebook more to advertise on their platform. One risk that we see with Facebook is lawsuits. They've had a lot of lawsuits in the past and this has cost them a lot of money. We might also see increased regulation in the future. For example, recently, Facebook did a deal with the Australian government where unfortunately it had to give up uh, Australian users' rights to um, share news freely on the platform because Australian media companies weren't getting the fair share. A lot of people also talk about um, being worried that Facebook is a monopoly. So a lot of people think that there'll be regulation to spin off Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. So it happens under different companies. And yes, for sure, this is a possibility in the future. This makes me think it might not be so bad to see the rise of other social media platforms like TikTok and Snapchat, because I don't think they're going to steal users from these platforms. They're just gonna be users alongside the platforms because most people use many social media platforms simultaneously. And if we see the rise in other social media platforms, it will mean that people are less concerned about Facebook being monopoly, and therefore they might be subject to less regulation. Okay, so here we have the income statement. Firstly, looking at turnover, it's great to see turnover go up over time. A very important sign, and I'd expect that from a business like Facebook. And then a lot of that is falling through to operating profit. So very, very high margins for Facebook. Profit for the financial year, going up, going consistent. Um, 2019 wasn't such a good year. There was quite a lot of um, administrative expenses that Facebook had to spend on. But on the whole, this is a pretty healthy income statement. If we move over to the balance sheet now, just a couple of things I wanted to highlight. Facebook have a ridiculously good balance sheet. Look at these assets, 159 billion compared to 31 billion in liabilities. And if you look at the current assets versus current liabilities, it's, it's 75 to, to 15. So that gives it a current ratio of five. One thing I would say about the balance sheet is that there is a lot of cash here, 17 billion in cash. And I'd like to see Facebook do something with that cash because at the moment it's just sitting there. A lot of it is, is invested, but there's still a lot of cash. And depending on whether they're planning a big acquisition or not, it'd be nice to see them use this cash in some useful way. So yeah, this is Facebook's balance sheet, incredibly healthy. If we now move to the cash flow statement, we can really see what the business are actually doing with their cash. So we have a nice run through from net profit um, all the way through to net cash from operations, which is even higher than net profit, which is great to see. Uh, CapEx is staying relatively constant or only increasing slightly in the past couple of years. This is what I mentioned about Facebook having low marginal costs, right? Because they are not having to spend more and more and more on CapEx in order to actually grow their net cash from operations. So what are they actually doing with this cash? So a lot of it, they're purchasing new investments, which is great. And yeah, they've started buying back a few shares, but there's still this massive balance of cash. And most of the years it's been positive. This year it was negative, but only by a billion. So the cash balance went from 19 billion to 17 billion. I would like them to see them use this cash more effectively. I guess my key criticism of this cash flow statement is 
They've been buying back shares, which is okay, like they've been doing it here. Um, but really, I'd like to see them pay the dividend. I've just been to have a look at Facebook's insider activity, and I've noticed that there's been more selling than buying over the last three and 12 months. And it does make you think if the company's management aren't buying back a lot of shares relative to how much they're selling, but they're using the cash uh, on the balance sheet to buy back shares, why do they think that creates so much value for shareholders if they're not actively doing it themselves? I would get it if they uh, had exhausted all other options on the balance sheet and you know they were paying out dividends and they were like, right, this is it, buybacks, last resort, let's go for it. But if management aren't bullish on buying back a lot of shares, then I don't think it's particularly great that they're kind of saying, we have all this cash, we might as well buy back some shares. And I would really like to see a dividend being paid out first before they start on a massive share buyback program. Okay, so what I wanted to do here is compare Facebook to the other big tech stocks, right? Big tech have got a lot of uh, stick for being overvalued, and that might be the case. So let's go and delve into it. I've put Microsoft and Tesla on here, as well as the classic FANG stocks. Okay, so what we can see is on a price to earnings uh, basis, Facebook is the cheapest of the lot. On EV to EBITDA, it's even cheaper. That's because of all of the cash that it has on its uh, balance sheet. Um, and it's also pretty cheap on a price to free cash flow basis. Not quite as cheap as Apple, but pretty cheap. Um, and as you can see, most of its earnings are coming through to its free cash flow, which is nice to see. Um, but I mean, you know, you consider on the valuation level, it's pretty cheap. But then if you look at the growth level, when you look at what analysts are forecasting for growth over the next three years, it's actually um, quite impressive. So free cash flow growth, it almost comes top of the pack, second only to Tesla. And then if you look at the free cash flow over one year and the turnover over one year, you know, it's at least middle of the pack. So I think that the relative valuation on Facebook compared to a lot of these other big tech stocks is pretty positive considering they're some of the cheapest when you look at the valuation metrics, but in terms of growth, they're actually looking pretty good. The analysts are pretty bullish on, they're pretty bullish on all of them actually, uh, but uh, Facebook, they're bullish second only to Amazon. And another nice perk here is in terms of the quality metrics, what are the margins on Facebook? What is the return on investor capital? Facebook comes top of the bunch on both of them with an EBIT margin of 38.2 and a return on investor capital of 21.8. So when you compare Facebook to other tech, it looks good on the whole, but is the whole sector looking overvalued? Let's delve into a valuation model to see exactly how that looks. Okay, so here we have the valuation. We're gonna start with uh, free cash flow and having a look at that. So effectively what I did was I wanted to build a matrix to show different levels of, um, of free cash flow and different intrinsic valuations that that would produce. So the analysts on average, you know, their geometric mean, they think the, uh, they think the free cash flow is gonna grow just shy of 16.5%. Uh, if you do geometric mean over three years, that's what they think it's gonna grow as. Then if you do the discount rate, I did a discount rate under WAC to see what that came out as. As we know, looking at the balance sheet, there's virtually no debt. So our discount rate is basically all based off equity. So you look at the capital asset pricing model. It depends what uh, long run rate you want to use for the S&P 500. I've used 9%. And the discount rate is going to be a little bit higher than that because obviously we have risk-free rate and the beta is going to make it the discount rate a little bit higher than the 9% because it's more than one. So our discount rate comes out at 9.64%. And then the other uh, assumption for this is the long run growth rate is about 2.5%. So kind of in line with um, where the uh, US GDP tends to grow in a normal year. So what we can see here is that when you look at very, very um, high uh, free cash flow growth, uh, at any discount rate, Facebook seems to look pretty good. Uh, I would be more focusing on the 15% area. So this matrix will show the upside and downside. Here's the current, uh, here's the prices it comes out as. Current share price being $258.33. So, I mean, I really think that this kind of area would be roughly where I would go. I think 8%, particularly for a tech company, 8% discount rate is a little bit uh, generous. I think 20% growth rate is a bit generous, but if you're at those levels, I mean, look at the valuation you can purchase it at, it's crazy. 
Um, although I would be roughly inclined to this, this you know, 15%, uh, maybe a 9 or 10% discount rate, uh, which is giving us 274, 232. It's, it's growing, its current share price is 258. So Facebook is looking roughly fairly valued for me, but it depends on how much you think the company is going to grow and what you think the discount rate should be. If you look at where the analysts have it, using the analysts' free cash flow growth and the discount rate that I calculated, that gives you a fair valuation of uh, $274. So you've got 6% upside. So it appears from our DCF, Facebook is looking roughly fairly valued. Okay, so here we have the median analyst uh, growth forecast for earnings per share, which I actually think are quite conservative. So this was just taken, all the analysts go together. This is what their median earnings per share growth uh, for Facebook is looking like after a, a financial year 2015 earnings per share of just over $10. So this is what we can see. We can see the growth rates here. When you kind of do the geometric mean of this, you get 14%. But historically, the EPS growth rate from Facebook has been about 34%. So this is looking quite low. I mean, I'm not sure if Facebook is going to grow exactly how as fast as it has done in the past. But I still think these are relatively conservative EPS growth numbers, particularly from a big tech stock. It's not usually what you would expect. Uh, and then, so for example, the historical PE, which we'll need for this valuation as well, is uh, about 31. So FY18, I left it out because it's an outlier. And now what we're going to look at is we're going to look at this matrix. And what this matrix will show us is it will show us the earnings per share growth and the PE. So for example, at 5% EPS growth with a price to earnings of 15, the shares are going to be worth $133. That's how it works. And here's the upside downside. So given the fair value of what the analysts think, the analysts expect a growth rate 13.9%, five-year average PE 30.8. The analysts think Facebook is worth $358 a share. It's currently trading at $258 a share. So that's an upside of about 39%. So looking at this matrix, I mean, whether you think the stock is overvalued or undervalued or not, it really kind of depends on you know how fast you think Facebook is going to grow. Is it going to beat this 14% expectation or not? And what do you think the kind of PE is? I mean, these PEs they're high as they should be from a growth stock, but they're not insane, right? You know, I'm not talking Facebook having a PE of 50 or 100. Um, where do I think is most likely? I don't know if we'll see quite the same PE as we would have done in the past with Facebook, but I, I would say I'm most I'm most convinced in in the 20 to 25 range. Um, and then in terms of the growth, whilst I think these analysts, obviously, they do, a lot of, they do a very good job forecasting Facebook, it is much lower than the 34%. I'd be more inclined to go for a 15 rather than a 10. And kind of, I'd be most in this area of the matrix. So that's about 13% upside. I, I think the PE that the analysts, well, that the, the past is kind of, we've seen from Facebook might be a little bit too high going forward, particularly if we see a market crash and people don't want to invest in stocks, the PE of 30 it depends what the other tech stocks do, right? Because going back to it, remember, Facebook currently has the lowest PE of all of that, all of those big tech stocks. Um, and then looking at the earnings per share growth, I would say, yeah, we don't want to get too far above what the analysts want, but I would say that 15% might be. If it's 10% with a PE of 25, the stock is fairly priced at the moment. If it's 15% with a PE of 25, there's a little bit of upside. So what's the conclusion here? Okay, so in conclusion, Facebook are a high quality company with a wide economic moat, they're in great financial health, and I think that they have easily the ability to withstand any cyclical decline in advertisement spending. However, I do think they have too much cash on the balance sheet, as you may have heard me mention. Relative to their competitors in big tech, I think they're looking relatively cheap if you're looking to invest in that sector right now. However, this doesn't mean necessarily that they're a good deal on the whole. Turning to their valuation, it looked fairly mixed. I mean, if you were relatively conservative, the shares look like to be fair value. If you're going to be more aggressive with your free cash flow and your earnings per share estimates, then you could say the shares are undervalued, though not necessarily by a huge margin. Quality company, maybe at the right price. We'll see. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I've been H Invests, and until next time, happy investing.